Hi, my name is Jamie Tomey, and I am pleased to welcome you to the Evanston Bound Corridor series brought to you by Artist Bookhouse. Each week we get to talk to some amazing book artists and writers, letterpress printers and paper makers. It's such a good time. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hi, everybody. It's me, Jamie, from Artist Book House. I am so excited about today's Corin Tour with Sylvia Alada. I just also want to mention that uh, this is our last live Corin Tour for 2020, and we are transitioning our Corin Tours into Artist Book House conversations. So look for those on our website and on our YouTube page starting in January 2021. Uh, I so grateful for everyone attending these all year long, and I'm so grateful for your support. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So today we're with Sylvia Alada. Sylvia, welcome. How are you today? I'm very well. Thank you for the privilege. Um, you've allowed me to reconnect with Chicago and Chicago artists. It's been a, I miss them. I miss the city. I miss the resources that that city provided. And, it's uh, the availability that gives the access to artists to create. So, but yeah, right, thank you. Thank you. I love it. We are happy that you said yes. <laughs> um, and we are also happy that you're our final live quarantine because you are about, about the book and the structure. And I'm so excited to get started. Let me read your bio here real quick. Um, and is your middle name pronounced Ramos? It's Ramos. Yeah, Ramos. Ramos. I thought I think I remember that. Sylvia Ramos Alada began her classical training in drawing and painting at the age of eight. Her first teacher was an artist who fled Budapest to come to America during World War II. I, I also have to say, Sylvia, I love your stories and I cannot wait to delve more into all your story of your background too. Um, after receiving a BFA from Cleveland Institute of Art, she was an automotive, uh, automotive interior designer for General Motors in Detroit. In 1995, Sylvia was awarded a US design patent for a unique journal system. In developing this system, she began a lifelong interest in hand book binding. She holds an MFA in Interdisciplinary Arts in Book and Paper Arts from Columbia College, Chicago. Her graduate school sketchbook on various bookbinding structures was published as The Exquisite Notes. This book, oh no, I'm sorry. The book has become, become her artistic form of expression from concept to production, reflecting a diversity of achievements based on her experience in industrial design, graphics, photography and print. Her work can be found in publications as well as private and public collections. She has served on the executive board for the Guild of Book Workers and exhibited internationally. She taught at Columbia College Chicago, Morgan Conservatory, Center for the Book, Paper Book Intensive, and Southwest School of Arts and Crafts. Sylvia is a Spanish Fellow of the Midwest Jewish Artist Lab, and in 19, or I'm sorry, <laughs> 1971 is what I was going to say. In, in 2017, she was awarded the Jewish Book Arts Award by Isaac Anolik Foundation. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yeah, right. I did. Um, so Sylvia, I am so fascinated by your, your experience in coming to the book arts, and I would like to know how did you how did you come from? Uh, you kind of mentioned this a little bit in that you created your journal system, but how did you come to the book arts specifically? What was your path? Um, can I start the slideshow? Is that oh way? yeah, let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna. Um, what button do I have to push your share screen? So go or? down to the bottom and share screen, and it'll pull you back up for the slideshow. Okay, so I could put the slideshow. Share. Oh, there we go. Let me see if I can get this here. Are you seeing also the ones on the left to the right? I, I am. So you're going to want to go to presentation. Oh, yes. There we go. Beautiful. Okay. Yeah, what walk us through. What you see here in the first slide is... Um, 
a page of the exquisite notes and um, in the back is my tool roll that uh, over the years I've developed, I've collected my tools and, and sort of honed in on what exactly I wanted as, as a book artist. Um, the Exquisite Notes is a memoir of the three years I spent studying uh, at Columbia College. And the way I take notes is I, I don't necessarily write, I don't use text. It's a narrative using image uh, drawings and they were done in real time. Um, what, what brought me to this was uh, in 1995, I received a patent for a journal. Let's see if I can find it here. This is it. Oh, I think your slides are moving forward. Um, yeah, no, I moved, moved, oh, no, you I, did. Okay. Um, oh, is this your patent? Yes, this is the patent. And what this was, um, you know, as a designer, I had want, it was an ego thing. I wanted to create something. I wanted to market it. Um, and uh, as artists, we usually find materials that are around us. And I decided to create a very simple, what was called, a, a, what I didn't know then was a non-adhesive structure. Uh, uh -huh. But it was a simple panel. It was a panel with four binder rings in that as artists, we always sometimes take our own papers and punch holes and all sorts of stuff. But this was meant for the creative. So there were pads of paper for like the writer and for the uh, for the musician, graph paper, blank paper, artist paper, art, you know, arches, reeves. And it was a small portable, uh, like a four by six notebook. And you can see uh, there was a medallion that I made uh, reflecting the Mudahar, which is really kind of historic in terms of my background. Um, Spanish background and the, the leathers were the, the key rings were interchangeable so you know you could buy it with purple rings and a black cover or brown rings and a black you know black rings and brown cover so it was just a creative solution to a very portable journal um, and it was a, a learning experience for me I received the patent but it's also on how to market and how to sell and boy that is really hard so uh -huh. I may still, still sell them individually but it's not something that, you know, you kind of hope it's, it's, it's a tackle to, to get, you know, to solve things in mass production. That's what my experience and my background in is industrial design, you know, mass produced products. So how do we do it? How do you make them? And how do you patch them? How do you sell them? And, but to do it in a, in a corporation is quite different from doing it individually. So I applaud those who can do it, who are able to do it. So, and then that's how I began to, and in this process, I began to learn about bookbinding. And here was I, a person who knew how they make windshields and engines and, <laughs> and doors. And yet the book was so simple. And I never even questioned how it was made. or how it was, I mean, I was aware of printing. But sure. the book was something a um, book. So that's when I decided. I took some courses at the paper source when it was on Franklin. Is it Franklin, Chicago? It's one of the it original is papers. Franklin in Chicago. And I think it's still there, the old lovely little building. Yes, so that's where I, I began to take classes, and I was talking to Sip with, well, you know, Columbia now has a program, and so at that time, in 2000, I decided to go and apply, and, you know, interviewed with Suzanne, and got in. Oh, yes. It was a wonderful, well, she was a wonderful inspiration, um, but since then, uh, in that period of time, I began to uh, accumulate my tools, because I knew, at that time, it was 40, and I knew that this was going to be kind of like the final stage of what I wanted to do. Um, yeah. I wasn't, wasn't too crazy about the, the, the issue of having computers and, and updating, you know, files and programs became rather distasteful. So I wanted to go back to my roots of being a fine artist. So this was a nice compromise because it uses different materials, uh, different processes and, um, so there, in that process, I collected a board shear and the job backer and guillotines. And, and as you see in this image, this is the studio that I have right now. It's my basement. Mm -hmm. And in the second photo, you'll see to the left, there are, there are uh, two stations uh, that I hope that in the winter of 2021, I will do like, you know, more intimate classes. So yeah. some, and I might do the book, you know, the original Columbia College book. But the student has access in those spaces. Each space will has its own book press, its own French press. It's all, everything will have materials to make even uh, marbled papers. So it's complete, you know, knives. Yeah. Where you come in and, and knock yourself out. So yeah. that's, and I think that um, 
I think it, it's to me, bookbinding is sort of a quiet, intimate uh, experience. So if I can assist and help students in that case, you know, even move on or jump to another structure or maybe have them experiment because they have the available tools there even the letterpress. So that's, that's the option there. So. Yeah, that's going to be so cool. And you're in Cleveland now. Yes, you I moved am. into your childhood home and renovated the basement so you can make it into your bindery. Yes. Um, uh, how did that, how's that working out for you uh, well, so far? <laughs> well, it's taken, it's taken about a year and a half to really get it all together because it, it is a it is a change i mean to get the to get the furniture right and to move things around and how am i going to sit i mean it took, took about a year yeah. and a half. i mean the suit you won't see it but to my right i have a fireplace here a wood burning stove so i have stuff that would make it more cozy oh. and the the uh, the left i had to design because i left chicago i couldn't take my bench it took the tabletop but i had to i couldn't use it so yeah. To your left, I built a custom workbench from recycled wood. Mm. Um, the top is from cher cherry, and then the legs are from Japanese cedar, made from Japanese cedar. And then the storage in between the space. As a designer, I, I like things all in tight spaces. So yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, in the picture on the right, you'll see a system where I have I created special shelving for all my boards and larger sheets. So everything is is within walking space. I, I usually I spend about maybe ten to twelve hours a day in this space. So, you know, there's also you want it all accessible. And yeah, and it's very it's a small space, so you want everything to be in its place. Right, and then I have a, my IKEA system that everything knocks down. So if I were to ever move again, I can exactly assemble the studio relatively quickly. So it's nothing oh. like things are everything is pulled, tension poles and shelves and. And uh, my parents are very, uh, I was very blessed to have parents who allowed me to have my own space, even in, in the home, in this home, my first, in my parents' first home, just to, just to work. So I've always been accustomed to having my studio right there, not renting a space and driving to it. So, uh, and it's, it's one, it's a wonderful experience to just get up at two in the morning and get an idea and work it out and, you know, and, yeah. right there, so. and be able to work on it when you're inspired by whatever yeah yeah oh i and love that while at columbia these are the this is the part of industrial design uh, my thesis was to recreate uh, in, in judaism there's something called the tabernacle it was a kind of a portable portable worship place i guess to simplify it and it had three sections in it and what i decided to do was the, to me the process of book finding was like the process of entering that sacred space mm. and these i these pieces and they all disassemble but they're made the top one is the book press and it's 24 karat gold and purple the silk this has the uh the press on the left uh finishing press is uh, uh silver and blue and then the sewing frame is anodized aluminum red and, and, and brass all uh -huh. all metals that are very part of that system and I still have these pieces and I still use them. So it's uh, yeah. that, was my, that was my final, you know, caveat, my jewels that I you know, had gleaned from that, that uh, I had created for my thesis project. Oh, I love that. They're, they're special and usable. Yes, they are. Um, this was one of the final pieces I did. I am a fellow, uh, Spurs fellow. I was part of a Midwest Jewish artist lab. And so then it was a consortium of maybe 10, 10 artists, each of different disciplines. And so then it was wonderful. It was a year experience. And at the end, we had to do a piece. So this was an installation on a, um, a ritual, traditional ritual called Tahara. And it is the, it is the, it is the washing, the pre preparation of a body before burial. And it's done by, by women and by men. Uh, and what I, I was a member of what they call the, uh, the, the Hever Kedisha. And uh, this was my experience. And I was, it was a, a piece to bring closure. My grandmother had passed away. Mm -hmm. and she was never given uh, Tahara. So uh, this was the way to create it. So it was uh, everything here is symbolic of, of some of the... Uh, 
I guess, Jewish, uh, the Jewish tradition. The stone that you see there is really uh, to mimic the color of the Jerusalem stone, because this is the things that have to do with thousands of years. And the actual mm. stone itself is in proportion to a uh, casket, a wooden pine box. So oh. once the book is stored, uh, you know, it's wrapped in the actual cloth as if it was in a physical body there. And the, and the book is really the story of the process of Tahara, you know, from the prayers to, you know, from the moment the person passes away to the time that it's, they are buried underground. The box itself has three holes on the bottom because in the real, in the real world, the pine box is three holes support the process of, you know, uh, deterioration. So... Yeah. And then uh, that was it. And so then what you see is the slab is where we wash the body. So at the head, you can see there are indentations showing that this is thousands of years. I just created fun creating this piece. Uh, and that, that stone was made out of cement and, and perlite. It's a very oh. process. So the stone itself only weighs like 10 pounds or something like that, but it looks really heavy. And yeah. The cedar, the cedar blocks the support, very, you know, materials used in the temple. And then the, the actual screen, the actual, I guess, the wall piece uh, was uh, symbolic of the uh, metaphor of the waters that people used to wash. Mm. Uh, and the bottom is the silhouette of the human being that we don't really know. We don't know these people that we do this service to. Um, so it's a mystery. So then it's really kind of a profile of a person that, that they will never say thank you to us. Yeah, the spirit in the realm and in Judaism, their spirit and their soul is hovering over that. that yeah, that, that and is that is that on the upper right hand? Is that a print from the book itself? It's an actual drawing. I don't. I you know to to do prints are, are it's, it's time consuming. But these are all my drawings. So the okay, all ink drawings and sketches. And so then these were the final the final hours of my grandmother. So. Oh. Okay. And, and so then as you go through that, um, the piece in itself is about 40, 48 inches wide, 40 by four. It's like almost like five by five piece. And it all disassembles. And at the end, it's placed in a larger crate that looks like a casket. So it was oh. just you know, <laughs> yeah. a lot of fun with this kind of stuff. But uh, yeah. if I, I had, love it. If I had more time, I would have wanted to create a sound piece of, of the waters. You know? Oh, and lovely. But it, Have uh, you shown this uh, other than at the Spiritus? Uh, no, it's, uh, yes, I think I have. I think I have at a synagogue. I'm not sure. But yes, it has been, it has been shown. Okay. It's, uh, but it is, it's there and it's uh, stored quiet. It's a very quiet piece. So. Yeah. And, and just like uh, life, it's very quick, you know, it's very quick. And it's, you know, things assemble, disassemble, close, boom, and that's it. You yeah, know? yeah. Our life is compartmentalized. And yeah. It, it took about maybe three months to create, start to finish. So the thing so that, that, that actually leads me to a question. And of course, we're going to move through your slides. But uh, when you are planning your projects, and this might help the conversation a little bit as we move forward, but what's the first thing that you do? As, and then like, where does the spark of the idea come from? This obviously came from the tradition and also your grandmother's dying and just sort of working through that grief. But yeah, where, how do you plan your projects? Well, I think that because of my experience in industrial design, I combine design and structure and unique materials to create any binding. But it starts with really, you know, sometimes I look through lots of things. Uh, I may go outside and maybe go to shows. Just even going to a hardware store may give you an idea of looking at something. Yeah, and, um, I begin with the sketch. Um, I begin with the sketch, and if you see the original sketch, it looks very almost exactly what you're seeing here. It's just oh. very, <laughs> very. My ideas have always been very quick. Uh, I some people like to labor and and says, well, let's try it this way. I just don't. When the idea is there, you just throw it out and do it and work with it. And then the process of working, things may change and will change. But yeah, sketch, I think I have something. At the end, I'll show you something I'm thinking about COVID, uh, and I'll show you how, I, how I'm thinking about this, and maybe that'll help maybe some people in creating. But I think my drawings, I mean, I have sketchbooks of things that I have never done in terms of a physical book, but the idea is there. And yeah. what 
is that as you, um, as time goes on, there may be something that all of a sudden catapults me and I begin to do that. I look back yeah. and, and then that's what influences that piece to create. Yeah. And you might, you might be inspired by just looking through those past sketchbooks too. Right. We, we past sketchbooks, but a lot of it is really, it's very unusual, but it's going to seeing other people's artwork, um, looking at uh, prints, going to the local Home Depot, looking oh. at commercial items, um, industrials, I'm looking at products. I said, oh, that'd be a great book, you know? Yeah, so, exactly. So those, those are the things, and it's, it's part, we all have file cabinets in our, in our brains. So we just yeah. like file them back there. And then it, and if some idea comes by, there's always a sketchbook by my bed. So if I have an idea, I just start sketching. And that's yeah. it. Yeah. Then, um, this was the piece that I did for, that I won for uh, the Isaac Analyst Jewish Book Arts Award. And what this was, was I had an old book of Psalms, small book of Psalms. And um, if you do the research, the man who awards this piece is a, is a Torah study student. So I based it around my my studies, Torah, and, and uh, to create a book or an instrument because King David was a, a harpist. So at the heart of his, of his heart was his love for, you know, for God. And so then I just decided just, you know, it was just, this was like a five minute idea, make a harp. And at the center of the heart, you have the, the uh, Hugo Peller book, pop-up book. Now it comes out the, the heart of uh, David, which is the book of Tehillim. So I rebounded the patterns here are Mudahar patterns. Uh, I have been exploring my roots in terms of uh, Spanish. We're from Spain, um, Mudahar from the people who were uh, Moranos. People had denied their faith. My ancestors had denied their faith because of Catholicism. So yeah. stuff was just just pouring into this piece. So um, the, in in the process, I and because of that, I also wanted to experiment with gold tooling. While I was at Columbia, they had gold tools, but there wasn't, they didn't have the resources there to teach. So since then, I've been studying gold tooling. So as you see on the upper left-hand corner, these are special tools that are Mudahar patterns, things that you find from the, four, the patterns from the 14th century in mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, southern Spain, where the, when the Arabs and the Christians and, and the Jews all live uh, together. So... I had I found a resource in Spain um, that that sold these tools. So these are all hand cut, so that the branding of the work that I would do from from now to the future will incorporate elements of Mudahar pattern. So uh -huh. um, the piece, so the pieces and the gujans on the right were English, but these were oh no, these are all made in Spain. In fact, I went to Madrid to take a class in gold tooling, and it was a uh, the instructor was a man who worked at the equivalent of the Library of Congress. Mm. And the owner says, I told him, I says, I'd like to get some gouges. And I, I think we were just ready to go on the plane. And he comes to the airport to bring me my gouges. I mean, so I, I, he brought the whole set of gouges that I needed, you know, and they're there to, to work with. And I try to keep my tools to a minimum, but um, this, this is what I, I have been exploring. I think also the other thing too was, when I was at uh, during Columbia, we most of the teaching and I find is that European binding only focuses, focuses highly on on German, the English, and the French. Their technique, but you know, where were the Spaniards and the Italians? So yeah. we looking at the root of that, and you know, there's people like Emilia Bugaya, who's one of phenomenal gold gold uh, does the phenomenal gold tooling in a book binder. Um, so. Uh, this is just exploration of different, and they have different techniques. It's really funny, you know, how they, you know, they don't do tooling, you know, this way, do in this direction. It's, it's you know, their own ways, and it's not neither right, right or wrong, but it's just the tradition that they try to pass on. So yeah. part of the gift of um, creating this piece, in other words, I was given a word, and that was the purpose was to purchase those tools to create this piece. And I went to Lion Healy's in Chicago to look at how they make hearts. And um, although they only kept me in the showroom, they briefly talked about hearts. And these are the actual cords that they use to create, 
you know, that they use in their actual heart. So it's just, you know, kind of a wacky experience of making a harp that you can probably strum, but it won't make any, any music. But that was, yeah. that was this piece. What, what is the size of this? Like, what's the size of the book? And then what's the size of the harp where it lives? So the book is roughly about four, three and a half by five. It's like a, oh, so when you're so doing, little. right. When you're doing a Hugo Peller structure, you need a small book in order for what happens is the structure, the, the cover opens. And then it, as you see on the left-hand side, there is a little tab, black mm -hmm. tab that comes mm -hmm. in and the book up. So it, uh, it, it just, it, it, the, the book is concealed. And when you open the covers, the black covers, the book pops out. So you yeah. really can't too heavy of a book. You really can't because it was just, it won't, it just, it will be hard to, to keep the book standing where it's at. To be yeah. Safe. Yeah. Um, oh, I love it. So, so you uh, did, I can see there's also some blind tooling on it, or did you do just all gold? Because the gold is around the little star right. in the middle. Yeah. There's onlays, gold tooling, and then there's embossing the tooling with gold, and there's tooling with carbon, carbon paint. Oh, so lovely. It's, yeah, I studied. I, I studied with Samuel Feinstein for a period for about a year, and he gave me an introduction to to gold tooling. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Um, yeah, I have never ever done it. I've only done foil stamping, which isn't isn't the same thing. No, there's it isn't, but it, of course, but it's not the same thing. Right. Very, very, it takes a long time. There's like almost like eight stages even before you put the gold in. Yeah. So, uh, that's, that was the process. And the branch structure is about, about 14 inches high by 18, 14 by 18 or 14 by 19. So, yeah. And it's very flat, goes very flat in the case. I, when I design, I, I like things that are, because I don't like to have things in my studio that stick out and everything is, and part of my life has been comfortably in boxes and stored and everything like that. I don't, I'm not a person, I don't like, I just don't like things that just float around. Everything is just like when you buy a product, you have a box and then you take the box out and your package is in there. So, yeah, so yeah. Well, everything in its place. <laughs> that's right. And then from here, I took a class with Daniel Essig. And this Ooh, was, yay. Uh, and so then, in here was the experiment of doing a caterpillar stitch. And of course, this is a one of the pages out of the book. There I must have like eight to ten volumes of books of subsequent sketches of technique and everything like that. But this is the process of creating the caterpillar stitch, stitch by stitch. And so then this when I do a project, I complete it and then it's in the back of my mind because there's a portion of that technique that I use to create other pieces. So yeah. in that and now uh, we had, in Judaism, there's something called sadaka boxes. They're cherry coin boxes. They're given. So then this is the same structure. Only the backside is the spine of a book where you can title it and, you know, customize it. And here are the elements of what you saw in the previous uh, piece applied in, in a different application. Yeah. So, um, this is also incorporated in the one on the right. It's again tooling, gold tooling, onlays, leather, and uh, marbled paper for you know other clients, clients who have private work. So this is a piece that I created for them. So yeah. it's traditional, something contemporary, but always a, a new look at something. And I like it because I see it as a product. And they say, yeah. How do you do this? How do you wrap here? How do you? It's just that's what I like. I like the challenges. There's no challenge um, I'm not interested. Or I get yeah. <laughs> yeah. You want to think. Yes, always, always. So, you know, and even in, you'll see in the in the image to the left, it was the experience. How do you put eyeballs into a caterpillar stitch? So it took a while, but I found the right needles and the right thing to process to um, challenge there. Uh, and so then uh, this was for the University of DePaul when they inaugurated a new president. They had asked me to create a custom case uh, for their piece that they were going to present the president. So, oh yeah, beautiful, uh, right? So, uh, in the uniqueness of uh, with the industrial design and understanding the basics of, of uh, bookbinding, I can begin to push out and say, "Oh, well, you can do this. You can do this." Yeah, 
It's usually no mock-up. I kind of know already how it's going to work, so I don't. Yeah. Well, your brain thinks in structure. It right. feels like your brain thinks in ways of how things go together. Right. They get expl- the, the idea comes in my head, and then it explodes. Like it's uh, when you see CAD CAM drawings, or I'm sure people have seen on TV, they show something, and they, if they blow it up, explode it, and they put it back together. That's how I see the product. I see it in rotation. So yeah. to like, visualize, it's just fairly instant. And I go, oh, okay. And then there's areas in the drawing, and then only when I visualize it, where I say, oh, this is a great, this is the area that I need to concentrate on. So I already know ahead of time where the hiccup is going to be. So then I work on my hiccup and then that's it. That's how it's done. Yeah. So when you work with students and they explain something they're trying to do, how does it help you translate? How does the way your brain works help you translate how to teach the student? I first do it in drawing. I I ask them, what is it that they want to achieve? What is Uh it? Oh, how do you want to do what materials are you using? I ask them all the questions because it's really their piece. Of and, course. And then what I do is I begin to, I says, well, is it going to do this? Is it going to do this? And sometimes I give them like 15 different ideas that they never thought of. So like they go back to the project. And then when they come back, they says, this is what I'd like to do. And then I begin to sketch. I says, these are, I begin to sketch where areas that have potential problems or yeah. what, what they have to wrong so from the sketch they can begin and then we'll make a mock-up here this is just even if it's a corner here this is what you have to think about before you do this because if you don't get this done this is what's going to happen and you focus because yeah. this you find you find that um and i find that a lot of people when i taught at columbia too in, in a couple classes that you really have to think of the whole project through, like some people have great ideas, and I says, "Well, how are you going to hang this, or how are you going to display this?" Right? Right. What, what hardware are you using so that it doesn't take away from your craft? So, craft right. is very important in, in creating a piece, and the knowledge of different items that you can modify. I mean, you have a wood shop in the garage, and I have tools that can modify screws and change things because I know that it can work. Um, right. And it's an asset to this. So yeah. Uh, these are pieces Ooh. that are uh, Holocaust victim. She has pictures that she had wanted to uh, uh, wanted to give albums to her brothers and sisters. There's only one copy. And Chicago is a wonderful place called Latitude. And it is a yeah. photo lab. And you can go there, rent the space for four hours and print out your stuff. And it's just a marvelous place. And so then this was, I created the, I scanned all the images there. And then these were all, this was the original, this was the original one. And then I had to recreate the whole thing using suede and Japanese mm-hmm. tissue. And there were three volumes again. Um, another version of a family album, this woman uh, had an old velvet uh photo album from 1860 and it was mm-hmm. it was fun. everything that was still was still good intact was the class that you see there oh all the pages were recreated in, in kind of a combination of a, of a sewn binding but it also is like uh timmy lee's book uh, very similar where it's flat you had open flat and, and so then this is the way the original book was created, and I just modified it, brought it up to uh, the 21st century. And then these yeah. again, images again, we brought in from, and then all the boxes, there were two boxes, one for her brother and one for her. So hers, she, she had the original one, and I get, again incorporated the, uh, the actual class and gold, gold tool gold on the side and suede so it's all pig skin suede and just it's just a newer fresher look and then on the tab of the of the piece there's a little red dot because it's something about the blood the bloodline so a drop of blood it's that's your family your family's known by blood which is dna blood is very mm-hmm. so within that tab was a little suede dot of blood, uh, from, made from suede inlaid in there and it's all oh. needed to all right. So there's just simple symbols, and I work with the client individually. So you know, she calls because I want you to do this, and then I, I send sketches. I go, "This is what I'm thinking about." 
we'll do this. And from the sketches, they says, no, that's it. That's it. So yeah. like, precisely, they're able to extract and says, yeah, they want that. And then to follow through, you know, everything is thankfully with emails and PDF files, people can see their album prior to its being created. Oh, I love that. You're taking care of the memories. You're, yes. you're yes. holding that dear to them right. and, and honoring that. I love it. And then this, uh, of course, Miriam Santano, former graduate of also Columbia, uh, called me. And Miriam is very interested in preservation. Mm-hmm. So there was, a, there, was a, there was a Lutheran church in Humboldt Park that would bring this man in. His name is William Cupiano. And he's Puerto Rican and he's Jewish as well. But he was connected with his Puerto Rican roots. And so then he is a luthier. He makes beautiful guitars. I mean, he's a he's a bonafide, genuine, certified luthier. And so then he went back to Puerto Rico to look at an instrument that has was long missing, and it's called a tipla. It's like a ukulele, five string instrument. And so he came and he teaches how to make this instrument in one week. And I'm talking Jane. He brings just blocks of wood and all the components. And then the, the church brought all the tools. You know, they brought the saws, the band saws. And he didn't sign. The funny thing is that they didn't sign any releases in case you get injured. Oh, no. People who create this guitar and this small instrument, they do it. They learn how to do it by hand. And all of them are working condition and they're just beautiful pieces. So uh-huh. in the process of that, <clears throat> Mimi and I was looking at I would. I would sketch, this is how it's made, you know, bit by bit. And so then um, we, had, we had told them, why don't you just make a kit? Because, you know, let's make a kit out of it. And so it's, it was a, it's been a project to make a kit. And now they have tours all over, you know, Puerto Rico and South America where they use the indigenous woods to create this piece. Oh, so, I love this. Well, the kits are cut out. And then they assemble, everything is as if you were a uh, Lucia, you make your own thing. And behind it, I was at a show where I showed the process from start to finish of how to make this little piece. And then people could play the instrument. Wow. And then you can see on the lower left-hand side, elements of what was taught with Dan Essay, I did on the side of the guitar. So the top one is the classical with nothing, just a standard classical, but the bottom had the elements of the carvings and the you know, the caterpillar stitch and some of the elements that was put on the side of the tipa to give it a more a folkloric appearance, you know. These yeah. are from the mountains of Puerto Rico. He used this is how they used to make instruments. And they yeah. coconut coconuts and it's just amazing. And so he uh-huh. elevated this to in order to to create an awareness of this of this of this mu of the musical instrument. So uh it's, I was very proud to be a part of that project. And Miriam has been also spearheading trying to get this into, you know, being taught at schools and organizations. And But they, they do offer the class every August in Humboldt Park. And people come in. And the class is only $100. For $100. Oh, so that is a, so cool. Wonderful experience. But yet I, I use... I use some of the things that I've learned from bookbinding in, into features bookbinding the accents in this piece here. Yeah, I love that. Um, and then this is another project again uh, of a wedding album. The client is a is a art director in San Francisco, and he wanted something with aluminum. So he wanted a little copper aluminum cover in a while. So I said, but this is the final piece. It was an aluminum four by. It was a I think it's a ten by ten panel of aluminum that I had to purchase and uh, hand sewn. Well, you can see the stitching. Yeah. Um, Japanese tissue and embossing and uh, invitations and elements from the invitation were also incorporated. So this was a simple photo album. This is not your mixed book concept, but this is all hand done. Even the images were placed uh, manually and 415 tape. And, you know, just, it was just a, it was a nice project. It was a fun project. Yeah. It's gorgeous too. And then this is the, the piece that I was working on, that I've been working on or been thinking about. And you asked about how I think about things. Yeah. This is, a, to, the, to the top is what's called a, a different variation of a sadaka box, which looks like a traditional book. And you can see the pattern of the mudahars, the medallion in there, marble paper from Spain. But 
the concept this is that there's a coin box that pulls out. So I've been thinking about the COVID as if it was those um, those Russian dolls. Yeah. Go on top of each other. So the concept for me, this this whole this whole period has been one in which externally uh, what was externally you know beautiful has now been degrading. So each layer or each book that comes out of this, the cover is slightly de- is slightly deteriorating. And mm-hmm. so it talks about, I'm trying to think of the, uh, how I'm trying to think of, uh, the, the issue of, the issue of how uh, the procession, uh, a progression of, of uh, sort of like being enclosed, like you, you being isolation. Yeah, yeah. The book that pulls out is really a mask. So that all, and then inside the mask would be text because our voices are also being closed up, you know? So it's kind of a personal expression of how I feel about this process. Yeah, um, which is yeah. Just, it's real, it's uncomfortable, you know? You know, the, and so then, so you see on the bottom was a, uh, I, I looked at an Italian book and this was covered in leather. So I'm trying to see, to create architecture and see the architecture degrade as you pull out the book. So I mean, mm-hmm elements of this so then the second pull out the first the cover will be just beautiful and then as you pull out the book something's missing yeah something is damaged and then so then as as we go on it's just a visual thing or it could be by pattern so it could be using three-dimensional texture or as if you see in the sketch it could be just elements of a pattern whole tooling that it's very elaborate on the cover but as you go in further into it it becomes degraded or not not what I'm seeing so that's yeah cool. so, this, this is what so I learned how to do different techniques or yeah and this is what you're working on currently I have sketches on it so in this is the kind of things where I have work in the back of my mind goes oh this is be a great to do this so I'm also I'm working on also uh currently I'm restoring some books that have uh, survived the holocaust oh and so I'm restoring those and I'm working on a piece to get to an Israeli uh, artist. Uh, so there's a kind of kind of things that have been just again using the element of the book, the, the Sadaka box, the coin box. So it's just just I just take those things and I just keep expanding on it. So yeah, yeah. Is this your last slide? Yes, it is. All yes. right. So go ahead and stop your screen share, and we'll go back to the big video okay and then um so yeah you talked about your your process of working and your process of teaching um when you were in grad school you were doing the sketches and you said that that was published um and right now it's not it, it's uh out of print right. uh what is your plan what is your plan for that in well, the future I have a couple ideas. Uh, I'd like to reprint it, um, but then uh, there's also the option to reprint the book as it is and, and just change maybe the title, like Memoirs of Columbia College. There were some issues with the publisher that they wanted to do certain things and they have their say, all right. So I think that when I, if I republish it or, or re- reprint, it, reprint it again, it'll, it'll be slightly modified. But there's um, others, the, the other option, the other thing too, is that because of the economy, students are always poor. Um, you know, it's just a tight. It's we, we're in a different era, so I would like it make it to. I would like to make the individual chapters available. So I'm I'm thinking of putting them on my website so that people can order. Okay, I want to do French technique book finding talk by Monique Clavier. So you pay and you get your 10, 20 pages, and there it is. Go have at it. So. Yeah. Because some people already know how to do accordion. Some people don't. But if you, you, you're purchasing a book that perhaps you only want one element, well, then just pay for the one element. So yeah. there's a lot of things incorporated in, in, the, in the sketchbooks that I want to take out. And I don't want to redraw the drawings again. There's an energy in those sketches that happen the moment they're created. Mm-hmm. So if there's a misspelling or half the word's not printed out. I think people will understand this is the drawing at the moment. And exactly. 
it will help you. And it gives it gives you that ability to, and then you can create your own library, then perfect find them and do your own cover. And then it's just the possible. Yeah. There. Yeah, so, make your own collection. Right. So I, I would like that um, available to, to people. And, and it will, it's, I mean, it's, it, you have to look at your, my mortality. I'm thinking like, what can I give on? I mean, if I'm not able to have students in my house, how can I impart what I know to other people? You know, because part of it is that technique. And videos, to me, don't cut it. You know, there's yeah. something about that individual, you know, hands-on thing. So if I can do it, you know, in my studio to weekly to two people, that's great. Uh, If you're not able to, a lot of people are not able to, we don't know if we're going to be able to travel anymore other countries or, you know, it's just, we're not, we're really in an unusual time. Right. Can we make this available? Can I make it available to people that they can just download it here? This is what it is. And if you, if it's not there, they can call me and say, do you have something on this? And I go, let me look at my books. I mean, that's, I think that's a relationship between, you know, the artists and its students. Yeah. Yeah. And Katie actually dropped into the chat and said that is a super and exciting idea. Yes, please. And there's a lot of reasons why I love the idea of selling it chapter by chapter is that, like you said, people can decide which ones to purchase, but also, um, and this is something Linda can speak to later. We, when she was one of my book binding students and we, you know, we would read through instructions in some of the book binding books, but if you don't have the visual of how to do it, if you can't actually see the drawing or the the photo of how it's done, it makes it really hard to read through how like step by step with words. I don't know if that was if that's just me or not, but I feel like oh, that's, that's, I, think that I have that problem too. And the other thing too, is that when you, we are taught visually, I mean, it's, mm-hmm. it's a visual thing. It's not text. Some people can, can read text. Oh, I understand that. You yeah. know, we're non in between. And you know, those are kind of confusing terms, some simple terms, but they could be confusing. So yeah. That, so that when you're standing in front of a bench, you know, those are elements too. I have a book that I started while studying with, with uh, Samuel Feinstein on gold tooling. I mean, those sketches will show you the exact, it'll show you how he sets up his bench, where he puts his, you know, tools for this, where he puts his heating, you know, so that you know that if you're standing there, oh, I need to do this. I, you, those books don't tell you that. They just show nice, sexy shots of, oh, this is it at an angle. Yeah. yeah. So the process here, this is the first pass. It should look like this. This is the first, second pass. You should do water in here, put steam in here. I mean, that, I mean, it's like telling a story. It's a narrative. And so then... Yeah think that and, and if you look at multiple gold tooling books it's, it's just confusing you know yeah. just oh here just buy this and then I mean even Sam will say I'll oh, mix this but well and why how much I mean yeah. it's for people to say this is your book now it doesn't mean that I'm it'll be the final say because really you have to experiment about that but this is talking to this person this is what they do now you can take it modify it and do whatever what you want but this will help you you know right right you know, you know, cook those juices in those brains and get it going. You know, that's yeah. That's- I think it would be really valuable, and I want to encourage you to do that. And I don't know what the. I mean, you you are the author and illustrator, so you have full copyright and all of that. But I don't know what you I would need to do on your website. Part is that uh, I'm always a hands-on person. I'm always very controlling over everything. You know, I've been told it millions of times, but mm-hmm. I I have a vision, and I says. I don't care how people do it, but this is how I see it. So right. um, it's really finding the resources that people can help me. This is how you put it online. I mean, I, I don't want to be bothered with that. I just, okay, I'll scan them to you. Can you put them online for me? Tell me how to connect it to the, you know, the shopping cart. I mean, those are kind of things that I don't want to be labored with, you know. I right, right. So those are, it's really finding the resources who will help me put that together. But that's, that's yeah, it. yeah. And that's the next step because people are clamoring for it. For sure, absolutely. Yeah, and so then that's what if that's what twenty twenty one brings. That's that's now the next project, or you know, work with that to help help facilitate that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Sylvia, for joining us today. Thank you, everybody, for coming to our final live Corin Tour 2020. We're so excited to have been able to do these over this year, and we are 
lucky that you joined us every week. If you'd like to subscribe to our newsletter, please head on over to our website if you haven't already done so. And you can subscribe there. You could also donate there if you are so inclined. Thank you for everybody who has donated and supported us over this year. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hi again. Thank you so much for watching this week's Foreign Tour. We really appreciate your support. If you want to learn more about our guest from today, please read the description below. And if you'd like to support more programming like this, coming from Artist Bookhouse, please visit our website at artistbookhouse.org slash donate. Thank you again for joining us.